Tonight we are working on a 1998 John Deere 6x4 Gator. Customer brought it in with a crank no start situation. They say they have checked spark and fuel already. Uh, both are good. So we're going to basically do a once over diagnosis on the thing and see what we can find out. Alright, so on any machine or vehicle, uh, first thing I like to do is do a once over of the machine, basic cosmetic and visual inspection. It's going to need a half ender there. Uh, while we're going through here, we can check our fuel gauge. Looks like about half a tank of fuel. Fuel shutoff is in the on position, which is a good sign. Overall, the machine is relatively clean, no major rust issues. It's not dropping any oil, not uh, you know, not covered in dirt and grime. Right here, I see a potential problem. We have a intake boot with a loose clamp. That's never a good thing there. Bypassing the air filter. Battery condition seems to be okay. No major, uh, actually no corrosion whatsoever. Connections are good and tight. Drive chains do appear to have a little more slack than would be, uh, would be expected. Not sure if you guys can see that. Maybe about an inch, inch and a half too much slack. So that's another thing to factor in. So let's go over here. All right. So we have dashboard lights over here. Not sure if you guys will be able to hear that, but the fuel pump is in fact running. Another good sign. So let me get the camera set up somewhere a little more stable here and let's start narrowing down what, uh, what our problem is. Actually before I do that we may as well crank it over and give it a listen. Alright so a couple things I noticed there. Uh, you may have heard it just did try to start to kick over once there. Uh, spinning over very very fast. I mean it's cranking over a lot faster than one of these engines would normally be expected to and not sure if you guys are going to be able to catch that <coughs> on the video but there's a strange kind of grinding noise coming from it as it slows down so what I'm looking at is I think we're going to have some type of low compression issue and this motor may be junked and that loose intake may very well be the cause of it, but let's get this camera set up somewhere stable and see what we can find. Alright, so what we're going to start out with here is we're going to do a spark and compression test at the same time. Uh, you'll be able to see right down here at the bottom of the screen, spark plug cap for the front cylinder. Right off the bat I noticed that it's pretty loose. Uh, not a Great sign there, pretty common for these style, which I'll give you a close up shortly here, for these style of screw on uh, spark plug boots. So what we're going to use here is just a regular spark tester adjustable gap. Uh, this one's currently set to the small engine setting. Get these for maybe five, ten bucks, and this is kind of nice because in if you want to be running a compression test and spark at the same time, this is a great way to do it. Plus, you can vary your gap and see just how strong of a coil you have. So, let's get the spark plug out of here, get this set up, and see what we can do. Not that I am uh, big into plug reading here, but you can see the plug is clean. No carbon buildup, no soot buildup. I mean, it basically looks 
fuel washed almost. Obviously a used plug, but gap appears to be pretty close to what it should be. So now we're going to take our compression tester adapter, M14 short, and we're going to screw that right down in the spark plug hole. Hook up our compression tester. Uh, this happens to be a snap-on one. I have an OTC one. I use just as much, if not more. This just happens to be the one I had out. Now we're going to hook up our spark tester. All we do here, plug this end into the spark plug terminal. Clamp this one. Any clean ground on the engine. So basically anything metallic on the engine short of a computer or something else if you happen to be doing something like that and we're good to go So now we're going to go through, we're going to crank it, I'm going to see if I can get you guys down on the spark tester and get a decent picture of that as well as on the compression gauge. And I don't know how well this is going to work, but we'll give it a shot. Might be too much glare. You know what, let's just focus in on the spark tester first. So we definitely got spark there. My compression gauge hasn't moved at all. We'll crank over and watch that again. Now, regardless of whether or not we have our throttle plate all the way open, which for a good compression test, you always want to have your throttle pinned wide open, allows the most amount of air into the engine, gives you your true uh, engine compression reading, the one that's going to tell you the most about how the engine's going to run. But we didn't even have so much as a needle flutter there. So I'm going to cut this for a second, switch over to the back side, and we'll do the same thing, most likely with the same results from the way this is cranking over. All right, so we have our compression tester. Hooked up to the rear cylinder, you'll notice once again I have my spark tester hooked up. Uh, quick note here, anytime you guys go to do a compression test on anything, di either disable the coil if possible, which a lot of times, uh, except for something like a CDI ignition, capacitive discharge ignition, on smaller engines, generally you cannot easily disable the coil. So what I like to do is, once again, this spark tester, and this uh, grounds it right to the block. So you get a two for one. You get to check the overall strength of each coil, and you're safely running the engine for the compression test. What will happen if you don't use something to disable the coil or ground the coil some t somehow is you're going to be released, trying to release all that energy, and it's going to find the weakest point. Naturally, it wants to shoot out this way through the plug, arc the gap, ignite your fuel air. If you were to just leave this hang, though, it can't. The spark cannot bridge the air gap from here. Most likely, it's going to find the weakest link, be it in the coil insulation or somewhere else, and you could end up creating more issues than you initially had. So, just a little side tangent there as to why it's always important to make sure. Your coils either disconnected, disabled, or at least have a spark tester such as this in line to help protect it from unnecessary voltage spikes. I will not be able to get you guys to see the spark on this, but we'll watch the. Uh, we'll get you on the compression gauge. I already know there is spark on the rear cylinder, but let's uh, get this lined up and give it a shot again. 
right, you guys may have heard that grinding noise as it was cranking, and if you noticed, we shot up pretty much right away to about 75 to 80 PSI approximately in there. We'll call it a, uh, you know, we'll call it about 80 PSI, but nothing past that. So an immediate pressure rise, and then nothing. So what I'm going to do here is actually go back and show you another way of doing it if you have access to these tools. Uh, I happen to. We're going to throw a lab scope and an ignition probe on this just to give you guys hopefully an even more visual indication of what we're currently looking at. Now we're not even going to bother with the front cylinder here. We're just going to hook it up to the rear cylinder and take another look at it another way. It's something I like to do a lot. I like to go through and uh, as I'm diagnosing sometimes I'll confirm my results or look at it a different way. It helps to continue learning and really sometimes gives you a more thorough picture of everything. So let me get that set up and as a quick side note for people who are interested, although it might give the overall result away, this is a Kawasaki liquid cold V10, the V twin, I apologize. FD620D. Once again, this is in 1998. So that might actually give it away to some of you people more familiar with the Kawasaki engines as to what we're looking at here, but we're going to keep going. Alrighty, so what we have here is we are using, in this case, a Snap On Vantage Ultra, a digital storage oscilloscope for those not familiar with the product. Uh, a lot of capabilities, super fast meter, uh, advanced graphing meter, some people may be familiar with the original Vantage or the Vantage Ultra. Uh, it's actually something I use quite a bit, especially with the ignition probe and then the pressure transducer. By no means an absolutely ne absolute necessity tool, honestly. A lot of people don't have these, even in the automotive industry. Uh, one major complaint I will say on this, just hate the fact that it is a separate, ugly, messy, wiry hookup for the pressure transducer setup. But this pressure transducer, I end up using that for everything from uh, compression waveforms, fuel pressure testing, um, diesel engine compression tester. This is a 500 psi tester, uh, transducer rather. So I use this a lot. This is kind of my go-to gauge setup. I have all my gauges so I can quick couple to it. Uh, only change I've made to the compression hose is I have taken the Schrader valve out. That way we can see the peaks and valleys of the engine breathing here. Hopefully I uh, haven't lost anybody yet and we're kind of interested to see what we're going to see here. So I'm going to try to keep you focused on the lab scope here as I crank it over. Uh, we got a 10 millisecond time delay here, so from start to finish, that's 10 milliseconds on the screen. Our green trace here is going to be our compression, our yellow is going to be our ignition. And I'll be able to show you guys a couple things that I like using this for. So let's crank her over. So we noticed a couple things there. Uh, you'll notice I let off about halfway through and then gave it a quick crank again and we were actually able to temporarily build pressure. That's further leading me in the direction that we had already established that there's a breathing fault of some type. So now we'll give you a quick run through. So right here what I'm seeing is we are building some type of compression in the engine. Now once again our green trace is our compression pressures. 
our yellow is our ignition event. So like I said, one of the reasons I like using these is, which is a video for another time, I mean a lot of guys can explain this a lot better than I can, which is who I learn from. But even right here, between these two cursors, we can go and take our look at our ignition timing if we were so inclined to do the math between the ignition vent event and top dead center. Uh, we can see here just in these three peaks ignitions occurring the same time every time that lets me know that I really don't have an ignition problem here. What I don't like here is the fact that I have compression and I have no valve movement in here. Now uh, compression waveforms is something you can look up a lot of different guys. Uh, Scanner Danner would be the a quick one to go to for any kind of compression waveform stuff. But what you'll notice here is it's a smooth transition. I don't like that. That tells me I'm not having any exhaust valve movement and honestly it's telling me my intake valve is probably stuck closed as well. So all I'm doing is building pressure and then dropping down. So it's acting as a closed air cylinder basically. Might be uh, a little too much to take in all at once. It's just uh, for those of you who are familiar or interested in using lab scopes. It's just a real quick aside on one of the uses. Uh, I plan to make a, quite a few videos. Like I said, this is one of my go-to tools from dealing with anything from the shop trucks, our uh, delivery vehicle, shop trucks, uh, any company owned vehicle, automotive repair on the side. Ba basically anything I can use it on I do my best to use it on. So let's uh, take our next step here. Obviously we have a breathing issue that leaves us to we're gonna pull the valve covers here uh, four 10 millimeter bolts on either side. We're going to pull them off and get a quick visual indicator of whether or not our valves are moving at all. Whether we have push rods in there, if they're bent push rods, which is a common problem people run into. So, I mean, like I said, we just kind of shot off to this to give you guys an idea of what other technologies out there. Just as quickly, if I didn't have this available or didn't, didn't own one, uh, after my compression test came up the way it did, first thing I would be doing would be pulling those valve covers to get a visual indication of what's going on with the engine. So let me get these valve covers pulled and we will get back to filming. Alright, so you'll see here we have the valve covers removed. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to try to keep you focused on at least one of them. And we're going to watch for any up and down movement of the rocker arms. Uh, our push rods are in fact in place on both the front and rear. So what we're going to do here is crank it over. And Now on these engines you may or may not get a slight oil spray through there. Uh, nothing to be majorly concerned about for the short period of cranking we're going to do. Alright. Alright, so you'll notice right there we had a little valve movement on the exhaust side here and then nothing. Let's see if we can get it to do that again. Alright, there we go. And you'll notice we actually got some secondary movement as the engine slowed down. We'll try to get a uh, look at the back here if we can. Apologize for the shaky camera here. I uh, don't have any fancy equipment for this. We just had intake valve movement, the valve that would be on the left, after the engine stopped cranking. 
So I'm going to show you guys something that may interest you here. And walk around to the side. Get this table out of the way. So I'm going to try to keep you focused. Like I said, I'm going to try. And just kind of watch the valves here. What I'm going to be doing is with the key off, I'm going to be spinning over the primary drive clutch here. Uh, key off because I don't want this to try to start while my hand's down there. Hand, very important. Gator engine that doesn't run, not so important. Last thing I want is this thing trying to start and my hand getting caught in this belt here. These are what make me money. This is not so important and neither is any other piece of equipment or any automobile. It's never more important than basic safety procedures. Uh, you can even go so far as to disconnect the battery. Uh, in this case I'm actually also go going to pull the spark plug caps off. I already had the rear disconnected. I'm going to pull the front off as well disconnected. Now with the key off we do not have to worry about this sparking. So, so it just as a secondary check that way we're double triple safe. So let's get you set up here to watch these valves. Alright and we're gonna crank this over real slow by hand and already I'm feeling compression and you'll see the intake valves moving now now our exhaust valve is moving fighting to get some compression here which is a good thing that's telling me our rings and our cylinder walls are probably in decent shape and we are also having movement on the rear. Uh, can't quite give you guys a good shot on that, but uh, trust me on it. We are having the same valve movement on the rear. You got the intake and exhaust again. So, because I uh, I know where these symptoms are leading us, we have internal em engine damage. Now, for you Kawasaki or small engine guys, you probably already know that uh, this being a 98, there is a very good likelihood this still has the plastic camshaft drive gear, which would explain uh, that grinding noise we were hearing when we were cranking and letting off. The plastic street teeth commonly stripped out, and you would get intermittent camshaft movement, or none at all. Or they would grenade and you'd have little bits of plastic all down inside the engine. Uh, in this case, judging from the fact that when I crank over on this primary drive clutch and we do have valve movement and the noise it is making, I'm going to go with a partially stripped cam gear. Uh, something that moving slow it has enough mesh to crank the cam over and actuate our valves. But once you get some real speed going behind it, it just kind of skips over. So in this case, we're not doing an engine teardown, most likely. Uh, I would have to imagine from the overall age and condition of the machine and the fact that it would probably be about thirteen to $1,500 to redo this engine, be minimum, because when, while we're in there, we're going to want to check out the water pump, we're going to want to check out overall condition just go through and there might be some additional incidentals that are going to be needed as well as all your regular necessary gaskets and everything else so between that a, a couple flat tires a broken fender up front the fact that this unit's about 19 years old and there's really not a whole lot of resale value on it uh, unfortunately this does not have an hour meter anywhere on it so I can't give you guys a good indication there as to how many hours are on the engine but I'm gonna go ahead and call this one as a stripped out camshaft tooth or gear and most likely there will not be a follow-up video for this because I would 
have to imagine they're gonna trade this in on a brand new unit something with warranty and you know slightly nicer accommodations by the time we're all said and done uh, videotaping this I'm not sure how long this video is gonna come out to but on a normal day this would have been this level of diagnostics would have been covered within our half hour of shop minimum here and for half an hour of shop time or an hour by the time you get done quoting and talking with the customer you have a fairly comprehensive diagnosis or a very good place to go to you know help lead the customer towards the right decision like I said I would be looking at trading this one in and uh, going for the new one this is a um, it's an environmental preservation society so they may choose to fix it or depending on their funding and donors this year they may uh, have it in their budget to get a new one so we'll go from there uh, hopefully you guys you you guys learned a little something I know I learned something every time I work on anything and uh, any questions comments concerns things you guys want to see videos of I, uh, I do work in a John Deere dealership during the day also work on um, anything from gators, lawnmowers, compact utility tractors, our CWP line, skid steers, uh, mini excavators, uh, small wheel loaders. Uh, we sell steel. So, you know, two stroke stuff. I'll be making some videos, some Honda stuff, some generator stuff, a uh, lot of gators, hopefully some compacts and all. And just uh, based off of what you guys want to see. We'll keep making videos and hopefully everybody learns something and is happy. Um, other than that, I think think that's a wrap. Like I said, I mean, I'm going to do my best to always show you guys with the basic commonly available tools how to go through something. I'm going to try to make some specialized videos, we'll say, on using some of the more advanced diagnostic equipment that uh, some shops may or may not have. That includes some of the specialty tools for uh, steel, 